So for the Dodge Perez session, uh, we've chosen people who have uh, spent a lifetime actually doing work in needy areas and trying in their life to show how they can translate the idea of equity. Uh, Dr. Solomon Chalea was, uh, did his undergraduate and postgraduate in general medicine uh, from CMC Wellot and then went on to work in uh, a rural hospital, a mission hospital in Gadag, Karnataka, the CSI Mission Hospital, and spent his lifetime working there. And I, I would say that uh, he almost single-handedly kept the hospital alive. He used to handle all manner of cases there. And he would also, for a junior like me, he used to call and ask how to manage these cases. And then say, you've done a good job. It was said that Dr. Solomon, if he had to take leave, he had to publish it in the newspaper because that is the number of cases who used to come and see him. And his work seldom finished before 12 midnight, which is what his juniors used to tell me. So I want to introduce Dr. Solomon Chalaya. He's retired now. He will share his life experience with us. Thank you, everyone. Actually, first, let me tell you, I do not deserve to be here. I think because uh, I was right from the, um, you may call a backbencher. I had no, <clears throat> actually, I did not want to do medicine. But uh, somehow fate got in and my father wanted me to do it. So I told my group observers that it was my father who pushed me. I would have been thrown out. But somehow, I hope I would have not done anything wrong to my group observers' faith in me. Anyway, I fin came and I had a resentment throughout my medical undergraduate course. Why I am here? I'm not good enough. And somehow I managed, I used to just aim to pass, not a single certificate or anything. And uh, I thought to make a, I quite, I was scared that I would do harm to patients. I remember internship, the first time I got the bleep was running towards the ward, then I stopped running. If I go there, I don't know how to intubate. So I slowed down. Then uh, my internship and start was quite bad because uh, I was quite confused guy, not remembering anything. And uh, suddenly my registrar warned me, don't go past the blood bank. Because uh, uh, there was one patient, she had to be given blood. And I asked her mother. So I asked her, I, they were refusing to give. And they started scolding me. The mother told me, I will give blood. She put it. I gave her a blood donor slip. And next was called from blood bank. Dr. Solomon is sending 70-year-old hypertensive patients to give, donate blood. Ask him to come here. <laughs> but luckily, they forgot. And finally, finished internship. I suppose I was sponsored from Bangalore. Karnataka has got three dioceses. And uh, no one wanted me. So that sort of was thinking what to do. The only time I think I was wanted was in Com Health when I worked in Rusa. We were given a farewell party as a, as good interns. So that sort of helped me build my this thing. Like I was fully down. And when I went to this thing, I no one wanted. And I got a small letter from the Karnataka Northern Diocese. They have only one hospital, and it was about to close. So you could go join there. I had not heard of this place called Gadak. I just found it in the map, went there. And uh, when I told CSI hospital, the, there were only Tongas there. They told they took me to ESI hospital. And I finally, I, when I told them, hospital, oh, hospital, German Dawakane. It is called as German hospital. So no, it is no one there. Why are you going there and all? So when I went there, then the, only the nursing superintendent was there. She asked me, why have you come here? So I told him I've come to work. So that's how I landed up there. And uh, it was uh, quite alone. We had some few doctors. And the very next, first, second day, I think, oh, a doctor from Velour has come. Come and give anesthesia. I, told, I was given a bottle of ether and a mask. I didn't know it was possible like that. Then finally, the pharmacist came, pushed me out, and he started giving the open drop. And the surgery was taken. After that, uh, I thought there's a lot I have to learn here. And I could also, there were fellow doctors from outside. They also taught me so many things. 
and uh, I so I started giving anesthesia to give because there was no one else. And uh, open drop every even they did a cholecystectomy on my anesthesia, but we had one arrest which really affected me badly, a child. So I thought I will not give anesthesia. I told the surgeon, and uh, I'll do safer things like taking X-rays. So I became an X-ray technician. Then the <coughs> thing came. One surgeon came to the X-ray room. See, if you don't give anesthesia, the ward boy will have to give. So you better come. You're better than the ward boy. So then I went and I started the anesthesia. I thought, made, made my own safety measures, the steps in my ear. I never de depended on the nurses while giving the anesthesia. There were things that they told me. Ether cannot kill a patient, man, they told me, but it can kill. And anyway, I started, I became an anesthetist, untrained anesthetist. And we had, it was very backward that time. There were so many, they were talking about tuberculosis. So many children, TB meningitis. Now it's not there. They used to come. So I had to do the LP, and uh, it was taught me by the pediatrician. Uh, that was just with the IM needle. You put the baby, and I told them, what do they cone? Hey, children, don't cone, man, he said. So I, I became, then you have to take the fluid and go to the lab. And how do you check it? You would put, you heat 5 cc of CSF and put the drop Benedict's reagent. So if the it usually CSF two drops, it will you get a reddish precipitate. That's a normal sugar. But sugar is reduced, you have to keep on adding drops. So if it is seven drops, it's severe meningitis. Then you take the LP fluid and examine for lymphocytes or polymorphs. And most was tuberculosis meningitis. And uh, there were a lot of, uh, finally I, Thought I'll actually I was thinking of doing some uh, only paramedical. Not that I had love for it, but I, uh, at least I will not be dangerous to patients. But after treating cholera and everything, you're sitting there and loading IV fluids, and uh, I thought I will do medicine. That's how I land up in medicine, and I managed to <laughs> managed to finish medicine. I went back. By the time Nihal Thomas joined me, Ari Chako joined me. Usually no one likes to come to Karak because uh, afterwards later the saying was that if you get posted in Karak, Dr. Salman will skin, skin you. So you better not go there because the work was so heavy. But still, there were guys who wanted to come and work with me. If we had a cesarean, Ari Chako will drive the jeep and we'll go looking for a surgeon. And uh, it was quite adventurous. And we had so many poisonings. My regret is that I didn't buy a ventilator earlier. I'll just show, for our time it was Dr. Ida Skado who inspired us. But it's this part of Gadag. This was, start, the hospital was started by Basel missionaries. They're from Germany. We hear so many bad things about Germany, Germans, but they were just, these are the sort of type of work they did. These are all photographs from the old Basel mission archives. This was the old hospital, 125 years. These are the German doctors who stayed here. So it was, that time there was epidemics of cholera. The first two German doctors died at the age of 23 of cholera. And one doctor, the surgeon, he was donating blood and he died. I thought we also used to donate blood, but we didn't have another thing, just with a you know, ordinary thing and they'll pump out the blood, suck out the blood. If you can do it wrong, can go wrong, the air can go inside. I think that's how he died. He completed the surgery and then died, so we don't know what happened. This is a training of young medical aides, health aides. The Indian doctor here is trained in marriage, Dr. Aiden. These are the first doctors who came. Uh, Dr. Zervik, the last two doctors that died of cholera. And there was a, they did, they started a church. There was an orphanage. Yes. Because of poverty, there were so many children in the orphanage. And one of them, this was so grateful that they studied in that orphanage because mainly they were given free food. And one of them was coming and giving donations of five lakhs, 10 lakhs as gratitude. No, they were giving donations to the hospital for poor, poor patients. 
their grandchildren came, great grandchildren came to see what their great granddad, their great granddad did, and some of them were quite angry. At least one of them, see, because their children do not see the parents once they leave Switzerland or Germany, once in seven years, and they stay in some places like an orphanage there, and they blame them for de deserting the family. And once they saw the work, they were quite satisfied. They had really done some work. This is one more, which is called the crash, day crash, where all abandoned children were looked after, looked after. And you can see the love. We always think that Germans told they are the superior race, but they cared for them. After World War I, they were all deported. I read the history written by them. They were just asked to leave India because the British did not serve. But they came back. Second World War, when Germany was in shambles, they still collected money and came back and helped. It's a malnutrition problem. This was the old, the first hospital, the opening of the hospital in 1902. This is the present hospital now. We put up, we managed to put up. What we do, we have to have a sustain. No one is going to give money. When I start joining the hospital, you know the bishop, he called me. Yeah, you don't take any leave. We work. You pay all the staff. That's enough. Then the staff told, sir, we are not getting enough salary. So you earn and take it. Everything is yours. So when they started, when the hospital was making money, they came and told, you know, let's share the money. We managed, first what we did for an ICU, we had many myocardial patients, we were thrombolizing them, and how we never had these fowler beds. If you want a backrest, roll up the mattress on the next bed and put it behind them, it used to work. And finally, <coughs> we started, when we started making money, we put it all on buildings. The building was very old, so it was all, this is our new ICU. And uh, how to keep the cost down, that's the main thing. Patients, as a policy in Mission Hospital, we do not, at least it's our hospital, we had made a policy not to send back patients. So we managed to get low-cost ventilators after shopping around. This is the Simmons refurnished machines used in Europe. It's a big market in Bangalore. And you can repair it yourself. If it doesn't work, pull out the sensors, oxygen sensor, pressure sensor from another machine and put it make two into one. By that time, they make other money, so you don't have to charge much. Only the oxygen consumption is more. And the same the ventilator can be used for neonatal as well as adults. That was my department first. You can see how it started. The open drop mask. I don't know if you recognize that one, the pump, hand pump, with that is called the EMO machine. You can just connect ether to that and keep, uh, that was the first machine. There's one more here, the bottle in front is called KM. It was developed in KM Hospital, Bombay, where you just put ether, you put your finger, there's a whistling sound, you know the patient is alive. But it's very dangerous, I thought they can go deep very quickly, in spite of the whistling. So this is our ICU. At that time, there was a cholera epidemic. The whole ward was smelling of rice water. The problem is you have uh, renal failure. And uh, there was no dialysis available in the city. We had to come to Bangalore and they will die by then. So we planned, started a dialysis unit. We got funds. This is a, just a moderator opening the dialysis unit. This is a family. There was a young boy once I met him in the Train. His name was Arun Lele. And he told me I'm half Indian. His father was Indian, a doctor in Sholapur, going together. What I noticed was he had all tattoos all over. And this is beautiful skin. And anyway, we became friends. Then he asked me, You're a doctor, you don't look like one, you know. And then anyway, he, he took my address. Next day, I saw that time you don't have lights at night. No. I saw a tall boy walking with the backside. The doctor, you, you told me you're a doctor, no, please help me, I'm sick. Then I told him, his BP was just 60 systolic. He has enteric fever and vomiting. So you wouldn't fit into the bed, he was 64 inches and all. So we put him, and he stayed for two days, we looked after him. 
he became all right. Uh, we had I'll show it later. We had a polio home for polio children. He was very touched by all that, and he had written a big art in his diary about the hospital. This is his mother and sister. This is our OT. I think the old picture is not there. We have got everything from laparoscopy to what happens is that once you start making money, the church starts asking for money. So best to spend it. So, <clears throat> so we told we had no money. So we got all the best done for the hospital, including the buildings, which they were not too happy. This is a colonoscopy. And if you want to keep the charge down, you have to do it yourself. Don't call for gastroenterologists and all that. So I was doing the gastroscopies first. Colonoscopy, you know, we got a surgeon from Gadag, Dr. Ajay. Then there was one pediatrician. He has just came and asked me for a job. I didn't know you were so good. So we started a neonatal unit. By the time there were so many beds, we had babies. We had to put two babies in one, one warmer. So then we put a new building. We started a 17, it's almost 22 bedded. Neonatal ICU. This is our new neonatal ICU. This is our seat again. This is also the money problem. Too much money. I was worried about. That was one worry. Seeing the blood every day, you check the accounts, um, ba bank balance going up. So we thought we'll get a CT scan. It was quite useful because uh, any head injury had to be referred to Hubli. So sometimes they are not required. Just a small head injury. So this was very useful. This is the X-ray units. We had to get. And we had to have a lab. Lab also. We got first a fully automatic analyzer on electronics, uh, uh, electrolytes. First what we did, we had that flame photometer. It's very difficult. You sit there and put a flame, try to graduate. And finally, we, we got a new one, uh, AVL for electrolytes. This is our lab. We got ABG also, a pharmacy. In the school of nursing, it was always, it's a, I don't know, I found it a dirty business coming for and asking for bribes and also I never did it. So we started taking, we had many orphanages. Young girls were finishing 10th, who have got no other, we trained them. I went to a big hospital in Hubli. The nurse came, well dressed and pants. She came, oh, yeah, I'm a student. She was one of the students who had taken training under us. And she's heading the ICU of the big hospital. I think our training must have been good. This is all our new buildings, our maternity ward. These are our boards. What I found is that you cannot uh, say if it's just by cost. People are willing. You have to save them at whatever cost, at the lowest cost possible. And you don't have any technicians. The unit, the nurses are getting, they were not trained nurses. Just ICU nurses. But you tell them the saturation drops, you just bag and call me. Then you have to come running to just figure out what it was. Is it the machine? At one time, we had eight machines going on at the same time. Because all the poisoning patients, OP poisonings, were referred to us. It was this orphanage was started more than 100 years back. And many of the children come and meet me sometimes. It is still there. These are the children. They were trained. In, they were, the Germans gave a lot of interest to the local language. They started the first Kanara newspaper. In uh, and there was one father Kittel, Reverend Kittel. He got so interested in Canada that he went everywhere, and the mission was not too happy with him. We sent you to work there to preach, not to learn Canada. But uh, he started the his Canada English Canada dictionary is still in all the colleges. Kittel dictionary. His statue is there in Darwar, in the road, main road. This is a. Uh, Orphanage afterwards. I was a manager. This was after 2006. 
100 year old celebration. This is a four year hall. This doctor who died after donating blood. Uh, nothing was done for him, but his wife went back to Germany, earned over, I think, around 20, 30 lakhs. She came and constructed this hall. It is a shame we do not do anything for her. This is uh, another one. It's a Asha Kiran Krish, where children were kept there. They all got one meal, so it helped them during the journey. Uh, around uh, 1993, a church from Austria contacted me. They t because the polio was so common there, the children, especially the deformities. And uh, they told, we, will, we want to help you. We will uh, start a home for the polio children. It was called the Polio Home. It was, uh, it was a small, it was a doctor's quarters which I gave them. Then later, they gave the money, the foster parents. They sponsored the children. And they put a huge, beautiful building. We had over 80 children. This is the art which they did. These are the orphanage children. That is the opening of the museum. After some time, actually, some of the social workers, they told me, or actually from here, they told it's not worth having all your children. You shouldn't do it. Leave them in the village. Let them live on their own. Okay, the, I thought uh, it was wrong. We uh, surgeon only the older surgeons knew how to operate on them. It re released the contractures. We made a, we had our own splint department trained, and they were soon walking. They got government government aid. All of them are employed, and they still come to see me. This was after that. We had only we changed the name. There were a lot of, at that time, AIDS had come in a big way. So there were a lot of AIDS orphans. So those AIDS-affected children who did not, who were not affected with AIDS, we made a home for them. This was at that time. This was a new bishop. He was an honest bishop. Honest bishop also, we have problems. Because if they ask for something, you cannot refuse. Otherwise, you can straight away refuse. These are the affected children. They are having... We had a sur surprise visitor once. It's not that he had come. Uh, his, uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam's uh, PA, he was my wife's cousin. So he just asked me to meet him. We gave a souvenir of the hospital. He got so interested, I didn't know. Because uh, he was just reading it, and he asked me, do you mind if I come to your hospital? It was in a different college. I thought, sure, sir, you come. So then we went and quickly made arrangements. And there was, there was no security. I had to literally hold my hand like this, stop people from falling over him. This was his visit to the hospital. This is in the polio children, with the children, and he was interacting with them. This is the doctor's order. He, was, he went back and asked me, how are you running the hospital? How much do you charge for the ICU? I told her, around 100, sir. Then how are you managing it? So we keep our charges low. And he put, wrote an article about me in his billion beats, and I became famous. A lot of people phoned up and asked me about how you're managing. This is the opening of a radiology block. There are Germans. Actually, they had contact with us still, and they were happy with us because we never asked them money. Although the... This is our neonatal ICU, a new OT. Other problems, there are a lot of problems that can happen. This was, we had a big fire in the hospital. I remember that date. I was just sleeping. It was a Saturday, it was, everything was going wrong. OPD went on till one o'clock and a very senior gynecologist, she had a reaction to Keftrioxone and she was in the ICU. And somehow I managed, told goodnight to the thing, finished rounds and went back. At 2 o'clock, there was a knocking on the door, banging. So I thought some VIP is sick. So the hospital is burning. And I had to go running. It was just some, maybe six months after the Kumbhakonam. You may have seen the gruesome pictures of the fire. I was just thinking, what lap up? Hospital is full of teak, huge teak from Dandeli. 
and uh, I went to grab a bottle coat and ran into the night. So it was like looked like a bombed off building. This is our new. Everything was burnt. That time we had uh, bought new computers. Uh, there was not a scrap left. And uh, in between, I, it, when I was got the news, they told the doctor that the doctor was trapped in the ICU. I went running there. Then her son was working as orthopedician. He meant, hey, don't worry, Solly. It's only office which is burning. So anyway, I was relieved. It did not spread to the patient sector. I was thinking of the neonatal unit, which was all teak. I mean, if you want to think how hell is it is a burning teak, there'll be nothing left. The next day I was walking past and I saw something which gave me palpitations. I went to see what it was. They were doing that flame autoclaving of the... So any fire was giving me so much trouble. And one, one very touching thing, when I was there, there was a big fire. We were all watching it, two fire engines. Then an auto came and stopped in front of me. And a patient got up and down and started scolding me. Here I am sick, no one is caring. I told him, the hospital is on fire. If fire is that side, I'll get admitted this side. So I was quite touched and I had my, I myself admitted uh, there were no lights, but we managed. This was one more problem. We thought the fire was because of uh, short circuit. So we're putting underground cable. Just three feet below, we found an idol. So very, so the thing, I, I didn't think the workers came and told me he found a cow. So I told you, if it's a cow, I thought it was an abandoned cow. I want it and I'll keep it. Then I saw this idol. I was, I didn't take it much. And then there was one professor. He can see you're going to get into trouble. You better inform the archaeology department. So the archaeology department came. They told what this, above the soil is yours. What is below it belongs to us. So sure, sure, you take it, I said. By then, there was, I don't know if you heard of the Ram Sena and Pajarang Dal. They came, put flags, and they started a huge crowds. Then they came and told me, you're a godlike man. That's why you got a god. So we brought a bulldozer. We want to look for Shiva. <laughs> so my friend is uh, from the BJP. He told me it's nothing like that. But there are experts. There's definitely gold here. Because wherever there's, uh, this is Baswana in Canada. The, by way, the place, how the, where it's placed, you can tell where the gold is. So, but like, unfortunately, I did not find any gold. But this gave me a lot of trouble. There was huge people, crowds. You know, I don't have that. And there was no government that time. He's a Swamiji of uh, Raj Revert, the Lingayat Swamiji. They are true followers of Baswana. He just gave one statement, do not disturb the doctor. The whole followers went away. Otherwise, they wanted to camp there and strike. And it just died down. I thought I would get arrested also because the police following me, <laughs> uh, police protection. But by second day, it went off. Then I went to see that the idol was so well done that the scholar told it's done at the 14th century. And Bhattakiri, that's the old Kannada script was there. That means lake. So it's a, every lake has a god. So that's how must have been floods and that idol had fallen down. So, but then I went to the, that was shifted to the museum. I went to the museum. They fully spoiled it. They cemented it below. And I thought it was safer under the ground because all the cracks were forming in the sand. And uh, Gadag was a temple town. There were many idols found. So there some once people told why they are disturbing them. You go, there are so many idols found. You go out and build temples there. But luckily, it passed off very nice, smoothly. This is the Swamiji. This is an award which they call me, and it's a very dubious award. Not dubious, I'll say, for reason. They call me, and I was given an award for rural service. I then asked them, why? They told you are the only person who's touching the patient. So I, I thought it's a dubious award hey, to get an award. <laughs> anyway. This is just usually it gets confused. Mission Hospital and this thing was in. We had a lot of snake bites. He, he killed it, but I did not kill the snake. Like, and uh, that man next to me is a professional snake catcher. So I asked him, like, let me teach me how to catch the snake. So he thought, please don't try it. I almost got bitten. Then after about six months, he came running with one more huge snake. Catch it, catch it. So I caught it. Then he told me, be careful, it's a cobra. 
this no this is another one i don't have that picture so then we quickly put it in a bag and and it's a big business actually snakes people came and asked me they want to buy it i don't know what for <laughs> maybe the skin or what but we gave it to the forest department i know them and they took it away it was most of the snakes we caught we leave it into the forest in the farms i think like snake bites we had seen so many over uh, in hundreds my friends used to be, scold me why you do not keep records of all this how much anti snake venom you gave we think we are arbitrary they have we gone to lot of i spoke even to dr anand on phone and he told we just do continue there is no fixed schedule 10 units 4 units there is one paper which says you lose you can use a low dose but we are worried about the incidence of going into renal failure is it related to the dose to underdose them because we had many renal failures also and local reaction gangrene of skin compartment syndrome so anyway we had lot of snake then very funny snake bites there was one man professional snake bite catcher he unfortunately was drunk when he had to catch the snake he caught it and put it in his pocket and he you know where he got bitten but still he came and he told i left the snake and i came and we, and we managed to save him oh one fa- one lady who sat on a wall and got bitten through the crack in the wall and there was one lady who came and told uh, we couldn't just make out there was no electricity and she was barely conscious and uh, hardly dif- difficult in breathing we thought phenoba poisoning then after the husband was changing address there was a snake inside a blouse and we did uh, i think i really enjoyed i had to finally retire and i got a good person who was taken over the hospital now they, they improved it some more they were doing angiographies they used to do only so many mi patients we were just thrombolizing i never i was scared of because of the cost but now they are doing re- regular angioplasties anyway i think i was an ordinary person i managed to run a hospital and i stayed on i'm still in the city which i never thought i will stay there thank you i hope i <laughs> any questions uh, <clears throat> so you are a physician as well as a hospital administrator yes uh, how did you manage both how did you balance it both i am a poor administrator <laughs> i used to run it shout at them when they come if they come you come and tell me what you want no meetings no this thing but i was very friendly with the staff because they come through all the in a tough way they they had started a very low salary and we really built the salary so they were all quite happy but uh, administration i'm poor and physician also maybe because it's because a jack of all trades master of none but i managed just without doing much administration my wife actually she was looking after all the accounts and everything so we managed that thing now that you have retired do you feel bored Pardon? now that you have retired do you feel bored because without all your adventures yeah i actually when i retired i thought i would collect a lot of books and because so because i had not had a single holiday even sunday was a working day for me so i had a lot of books and music i sat back one month and i got depressed <laughs> and all patients coming and shouting at me they see me out hey what you're not in hospital so finally I, I, you cannot go back to the same hospital because your style is different i still do uh, i got a clinic i just manage and lot of patients come still uh any things you want to tell the younger generation sorry it is uh, like you have to just take what like for, for me for personally i don't think i was succeeded anywhere else i know one of accepted me abroad or anything i wanted to go what was for my nature i think this was best i would tell that you the younger generation there are a lot of myths about mission hospitals that they are very bad run with old secretaries and old medical students uh, medical superintendents will not let you work which is true also but uh, 
Do not use it as an excuse to go away. You have a ready-made hospital. You have staff. You can do a good job. Do not use it as an excuse. But I know many people who had a bad time in mission hospitals. So it's a both way it goes. But you try to stay on, you can still work. There are a lot of things you can do now. I don't think any other hospital has given me so much opportunities to work with the people. So I would tell them, mission hospitals are not too bad. You will enjoy. You can be your own self and work there. And if you want someone like Dr. Abdul Kalam to have tea with you, Dr. Abdul Kalam actually came and had tea with me. And I learned she's a pure vegetarian. I didn't know it. He eats only vada, rasam, and, and so long he sat with me in the having tea. So you can have some important people like him if you work in a mission hospital. Anyone has any doubts about working or the condition, you can call me anytime or send me a mail. Or you can talk to me directly. I'm poor in computers. Thank you, Thank sir, you. for that inspiring talk. I would like to request Dr. Anand to present Dr. Solomon the memento.